All right, David White, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are a poet, philosopher, writer, lecturer, and you've written a lot of books of poetry, poems, and we're going to talk about some of that today. But before we do, let's talk about how you got to be doing what you're doing today, because you're not, you weren't always a poet and a writer. In fact, you were a, you have your degree in marine zoology. So how did you go from marine zoology to writing poems? Yes, actually, it's more accurate to say that actually I always have seen myself as a poet from when I was very little, actually, or however, seeing yourself as a poet is configured in a very young mind of a seven-year-old or eight-year-old. So sciences were really a kind of excursion for me. I was very influenced by the lyrical articulation of a wonderful mother, an Irish mother, growing up in the north of England, and her beautiful singing voice as well as her storytelling voice. And I think early on, I always saw poetry as a secret code to understanding. And I felt quite early on when I was young that the adult world was living in a kind of amnesia of this basic code of the priorities of life. And I always felt that in poetry, in a sense, the original powerful innocences of childhood were kept alive into adulthood. So I was very happy in my initial disappointment with listening to the conversation of the adult world. I don't know if you ever had that experience, Brett, of listening to adults when you were a child and thinking that these people were actually quite insane. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I know I've had those moments. <laughs> As to what their priorities were and what they were interested in. And uh, so I was quite relieved to find poetry kept, it was possible to keep what I felt was really precious and really alive, to keep it vibrant into what we call adulthood or into yeah, being an adult uh, male in my in my instance, yeah. And, but then you did poetry. You always thought yourself as a poet, but then you decided to go get a degree in marine zoology. What happened there? Well, I was caught by the image of Jacques Cousteau, the great French ah. marine zoologist and the inventor of the aqualung. And he had a series on the television that was worldwide, really, back in the 60s, where he traveled on the good ship Calypso and made documentaries of what he discovered in the oceans and particularly underwater, which was quite revolutionary. And so I was so moved by that life that he led that I just thought it was astonishing that you could have work like this. You know, my my images of work were all the images of a young boy, which was being a fireman, being a soldier, being a train driver, you know, all of those and my father was a skilled electrical jointer of the large cables that go into power stations. So that was part of my imagination too. And then suddenly to see that you could have work that would take you over these blue water horizons was really quite incredible. So I was completely and utterly taken apart. I mean, I, I remember standing with my mouth open in front of the television and so uh, just a year or two later, when I had to specialize, I made a kind of vow there, I suppose, in front of the television, that I would I would follow the life of the dolphin aboard the good ship Calypso or whatever equivalent I could find. And in the British system, you had to, in Yorkshire, in the north of England, where I grew up, you had to specialize at 15. You had to choose between sciences and arts. And so I chose sciences because I, even though I was writing poetry from quite seriously in my early teens, I always knew I could pick up a book of Wordsworth or Emily Dickinson myself. I wouldn't be able to pick up a book on ecological genetics myself. You know? So I, I didn't think it was that great a sacrifice actually to do sciences. I just found it much harder than my more scientifically inclined mates, friends, you know. I had to work twice as hard they did to get the same results. But I did I did get the results to go to university and study marine zoology. And then, luck of the Irish, I mean, it was luck, luck. It was a series of incredible circumstances. I got this job in the Galapagos Islands as a guia naturalista, I learned it was called later when I learned Spanish, a naturalist guide. 
and it totally transformed my world and my young adulthood, my young manhood. I was, I think I was 20, uh, 22 when I went out there, 21. So uh, really quite an astonishing opportunity for a young man to have. Well, how did it change? Because you're not doing that anymore. Uh, how did I change from marine zoology? Yeah. Yes. Well, after over a year there, a year and a half or so, the, the islands had completely transformed not only my understanding of what I thought was a scientific world, but it had completely transformed my identity as a person. You know, I, I went there with the unconscious sense that your identity depended on what you believed and your inherited beliefs, especially. And uh, really, Galapagos didn't care what, about what you believed at all. And it was really inviting you into this deep, fierce, almost warrior-like sense of attention and intentionality. And I realized in very short order that my identity actually depended on the depth of attention that I was giving to things that were other than myself animals, birds, plants, landscapes, seascapes, and that the deeper the powers of attention I had using all my five senses, the deeper sense I had of myself. Yeah. So really I understood, I came to understand human identity as a kind of live conversation. And when you weren't meeting anything other than yourself, you had nothing in the way of a real identity, really, just you were just making proclamations to the world, mostly defensive proclamations because you were so unconsciously afraid of it. So part of paying deep attention to the world is to become, first of all, consciously afraid because there's no way of really meeting this, this incredibly powerful set of elements we call life without being terrified by it. And Galapagos did terrify me. And then finding the part of you that has the same kind of terrifying elemental nature as the world. And so getting beyond fear in a way by being fully in the conversation. And I had plenty of opportunity to be in those terrifying conversations, diving with all kinds of very powerful creatures under the water, you know, six or seven different species of sharks down there and orca whales and angry uh, male sea lions at times and and almost drowning caught in a, a kind of mini mini tsunami one day so and having various uh, life-threatening adventures on the sailing boats on which we traveled from island to island so so it was a great old adventure for any young man or woman to have actually and I imagine those the, that fear you experience, those and just the, all those experiences, like science, the, the language of science, it, it it can only go so far in describing it. And poetry probably does a better job of of capturing that those those that experience and those emotions. Yeah, I mean, science is marvelous to give us, uh, especially around nom- Linnaean nomenclature. You know, uh, Linnaeus, the great Swedish uh, classifier, who gave Latin names to everything and which caught on around the world. So it, it was a way, really, of uh, of our all being able to talk about the same thing and know what we were talking about. But uh, it certainly didn't mean to say that the name we had given to an animal or bird or plant was actually accurate, you know? and that the world actually speaks back to you in its very, very own, very, very particular voice, And I mean, all great scientists actually discover that themselves, that, uh, you know, whether it's a set of numbers in data that you're looking at, the data starts to speak back to you instead of you trying to manipulate the data to what you want the numbers to show you when you first started, you know. All scientists have to get beyond themselves. But I was really interested in speaking to this conversational identity where the world starts to talk back to you. And and when he talks back to you, it finds a much larger person than the, the one who first began the journey into that world. And it's someone who, what you might say in the old Catholic tradition, has been uh, has been shriven. You know, the outer casing, the uh, the outer uh, complications of being human have been shriven away, have been 
taken away. And what you're left with is, is this radical simplicity which to begin with, you don't know what to do with it all, you know, because you were used to all the complicated names you'd given yourself and what you were good at and what you weren't. And this radical simplification, this elemental conversation, actually puts you into a frontier conversation with the unknown, where to begin with, you're actually not meant to understand what you're working with now. It's a bit like when you're at the beginning of a romantic relationship and you're so shy and you don't know what to say or how to say it or what to wear. (laughs) So it's the same at the beginning of a passionate relationship with with the world. In in, in your work is exploring this conversational nature of reality. Yeah, You you spend a lot of time, not a lot, but quite a bit about our interaction with work. Particularly, you you wrote this book, decade ago, two decades ago, called The Heart Aroused, about bringing soul back into the corporate world, into the office space. And I I think that's really interesting because I think most people, when they think of poetry, they don't think of poetry speaking to office work. They might think of poetry maybe speaking to artisanal work or farmer, like a a Wendell Berry. But for some reason, we, we, for me at least, maybe there's just me, we often think, well, poetry, arts, literature has nothing to say about 21st century office work. Why, why do you think there's that disconnect? Like, why, why are we able to say, oh, yes, we can have poetry about farms and agriculture, but not spreadsheets and computer, sitting at a computer yeah. all day? Well, the intuition is a good one because the language we tend to use in the office is so deracinated and it's been taken away from, from the racines, from the roots of real human experience. So... So we use euphemism, we use jargon, we use, uh, we use words to cover up what's actually going on because we don't actually face up to a lot of the, the hierarchical imperatives that until now have uh, steered relationships in the workplace. I think they're being broken apart now. So it's very hard to use the language of the office. You'll see none of my poetry used as the language of the office, really. You have to bring the greater human language to bear on the dynamics of the workplace, whether it's in the human resources department or in leadership or on the shop floor, you know, on the, uh, on the line where people are uh, working, uh, actually doing physical work. So it just seems very, very evident to me that it's not a passive process to work. You can't, work 40 hours a week in the classic sense and and be someone else than the way you're made and not suffer from that covering over of who you are. The understanding, you know, whether it's in physical work or whether it's in the offices is, well, I'll recover myself at the weekend you know, or on holiday. But actually, you're actually practicing at being someone when you're in your workplace Imagine if you played an instrument, Brett, for the number of hours, the same number of hours that you do your work. So say in a classic sense, if you practiced six, seven, eight hours a day at the piano, at the saxophone, at the violin, could you imagine how good you would get? And you wouldn't even have to have any musical proclivity. If you practiced so many hours a day, you would get incredibly good. So uh, it's interesting to think that when you're in the workplace or on the phone or in the meeting room, you're actually practicing at being someone. And because you're practicing at it so much, seven or eight hours a day, five days a week at least, and if you're in leadership, it stretches into the, into the weekends, there's no one else you're going to become than that person you're practicing so much at, yeah. So it's a very beautiful and disturbing question to ask yourself. By the way, I am in my work, you know, where I spend most of my time. Who or whom am I practicing at becoming? Do I even want to become that person? Almost always because of the manipulations and coercions and besiegements of the workplace, we almost always start to actually cultivate a defensive 
kind of personality in the workplace rather than an invitational one. So a lot of my work, you know, as far as talking about the soul in the workplace is, is that simple movement from a defensive to an invitational identity. I mean, you can look at a definition of the soul as being that part of a person. You know, you don't need to attach it to any religious, any religious inheritance. But uh, to my mind, the soul of a person is that part of a person that's trying to belong to the world in the biggest way they can, you know. And the soul can be quite ruthless in breaking down defenses that you've set up, actually. Sometimes we look on the outside and realize that we've sabotaged the work we were doing, actually. And it looks as if you've actually inflicted self-harm. But to the soul, it may have been something it's been quietly engineering for years so that you could break out of this imprisonment. You know? Being fired or, or being made bankrupt may be a disaster for the personality. It may be something your soul has been quietly preparing you for for years, yeah, so that you could break out of something that is incredibly deleterious and incredibly threatening to what is most precious to you, and that's the one life you can lead that no one else can lead in your stead. So you said so soul's this idea, it's it's that something the bigger thing that wants to connect and engage with the world that's bigger it's the, than us. Yeah, it's the faculty of belonging in the Faculty of belonging. And then yeah. you said personality. Is that like the ego, the self? Yes. And uh it's what I call I call it the strategic mind. Uh, you, it's, it gets called all kinds of things. You know, in the Eastern tradition it's the monkey mind. William Blake actually called it Satan. <laughs> <laughs> And But it's only Satan when you put it first, when you think that the thoughts you have are you, or the names you've given to your wife, to your children, to your intimate partner, to your work, are real. Yeah. And instead of letting your wife speak back to you in her own voice, instead of the one you've thrown into her body through a kind of psychological ventriloquism, when you let your child speak back to you as the person they are, rather than what you're trying to shape them into when you let anyone speak back to you in, in their own voice. I mean, this is a big thing around gender nowadays to just allow people to be themselves, whatever they call themselves and however they, what does it have to do with us, how they see themselves, except in the sense that we should be curious about it in a real foundational way, in an invitational way. Who's this person? coming into my life now let them announce themselves instead of my instead of my naming them let my work start to name itself almost always we find we enter a vocation with with certain very simplistic goals and ambitions and we find that it leads us in a through the trials and humiliations of a career path to to its true essence we almost are always come to understand the true essence of a work through through humiliation and through a, a certain kind of outer failure. Yeah, and I want to talk dig deep into that because you have you have some great pros and insights about that. But also, you mentioned that people go in with simple and sort of come sometimes pure ideas of why they started a career. It's very soulful, but then eventually, for some for some re whatever reason, personality can take over. Right, you, you forget. That, yeah. that soulful reason why you joined. I mean, I know this happens to a lot of attorneys. Like some attorneys, they go to law school thinking, well, I'm going to, you know, do some sort of social justice, environmental justice. I'm going to help the elderly. I'm going to help, I'm going to do a cause. But then they get to law school and they realize, oh my gosh, I have so many student loans. Exactly. I can't, I can't pay yeah. them off, you know, working as a public defender. So I might as well take that corporate gig because I got to do that. Yes. Yeah. George Eliot, the great 19th century writer was brilliant on this slow process of disbelief and disappointment and giving up on what was not just an ideal, but was something that lived in a very real way inside you. Yeah. So keeping your soul alive is incredibly important. It's very difficult in the American system. You know, French doctors, if they qualify, and it's very hard to qualify even to study to be a doctor, you know, 
but if you make it, it's all paid for. So, so you appear in the world and you, you don't have to pay off all of these loans. So idealism in the French system is much, is much higher, which is a turnaround from the way we usually see, see the French. Yeah. So part of it is the systems we've made and the, and the, the burdens we place on young people. And we're starting to re- re- realize that societally. I know there's a movement to forgive student loans just because of the way it's, it's just crushing a whole generation, but also the way it's actually holding our economy back at the same time. There should be a way of letting yourself loose on the world in your 20s, yeah, where you're able to invite what I call to invite the right kind of peril. Yeah. Everyone, in order to find their way, has to invite the right kind of danger into their life. We all know what it's like to invite the wrong kind of danger into our lives. And part of the, the difficulty of the path, of the human path, is finding out what dangers you're supposed to call that are germane to your future work. Yeah. So Galapagos, I thought I was going out there as a scientist who would impress everyone, you know, by taking people lecturing around the islands. That was the, that was the job of a naturalist guide, was to be a police man or woman and an educator at the same time. But mostly, you know, you, the basic youthful image was of you being this immortal boy god scientist who would tell everyone what, what was going on. And it wasn't long before I realized I knew, I knew very little of what was actually going on <laughs> and that this place not only was way beyond what I could understand, but it also terrified me. It terrified my scientific naming identity and it terrified me as, a, as an immortal young man because I was put in physical touch with death on a daily basis there whether it was above water or below it. And many times, because we were living on this death-dealing medium called the ocean, day after day after day, where things go wrong <laughs> on a regular basis, you know, I felt that threat against my physical person too. So, But I had unconsciously, I think, taken myself to that place in order to emancipate myself into the understandings and qualities that would actually make me a decent poet and uh, and out of that a, a philosopher too a human philosopher well let's dig into this idea more about finding the right kind of peril um, because in your book the how to rouse you have this great chapter where you do this mythopoetic exploration of the poem beowulf now, I'm sure yes. a lot of people who are listening to this, men who are listening to this, they've they've read that poem and it's something it resonated with. I mean, what, what's not to like about it? You got these, you know, monsterine monsters. You do this exploration of how this poem can be used to help men in particular, I think, explore the fear of bringing soul into their work. So what do you think, what insights can we get from Beowulf on how to bring more soul into whatever work we have? Well, the particular story I work with is when Beowulf is called to the court of King Hrothgar in Denmark because um, at night, you know, after the feasting is over at two o'clock in the morning, after the gold and the silver and the horses and the land has been given out to all the champions and families that are loyal to the king, something awful, green, monstrous and dripping comes out of the local swamp, breaks down the stockade gate, fights off the guards, shatters the doors of the hall, makes its way into the hall and carries off a young man and young woman every night back into the swamp where it eats them alive. It's a very, very powerful image. And Beowulf invites himself to confront this monster. So here's this warrior, this received understanding of what it means to be a man. You know, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. This is a John Wayne of the, uh, of the 6th or 5th century AD. 
But it's also the threshold whereby Beowulf is now going to step into his inner life. Yeah. What rises out of the swamp is everything that has, is, has not been confronted in the upper world. Yeah. And it's really interesting that the story is quite specific, that this monster, who is known as Grendel, carries off a young man and young woman into the swamp where it devours them. Yeah. So whatever has not been faced, whatever you have not spoken to, you know, as you said, you know, you start off with this beautiful, precious idealism as a young doctor or a young lawyer, and the weight of the world comes down on you and you say, I, it's not possible for me to have that conversation. And in fact, that conversation makes me feel uncomfortable and I don't know what to do with it. Therefore, I'm going to push it away. I'm going to ignore it. Um, it's all very well during the lighter hours of the day when you can u- use your willful strategic mind to keep those powers uh, under uh, ground, you know, under the water. But at two o'clock in the morning, and this is very specific in the poem that it's in the early hours of the morning, which is, you know, from a medical and scientific point of view, is when your system and your your psychological system and your immune system is at its lowest ebb. That's when this powerful, monstrous form comes up and devours the young man and young woman in you. It's, in many ways, it's devouring your youthful innocence. So we tend to think of innocence as something that is supposed to, through the processes of maturity, be replaced by experience, yeah. And we pride ourselves on once having been innocent, but now we're experienced here. And so we don't get into so much trouble anymore. But, you know, a sharper understanding, say William Blake's understanding, he saw William Blake, the great poet and engraver of the early 19th century, the early 1800s. He saw innocence as a kind of faculty that was never supposed to be replaced by experience, actually. Innocence was supposed to take on experience as a good servant to its initial understandings of how it could perfect itself in the world. And so this is, you know, this is what is most precious coming up from the swamp, you know, breaking in through our assiduously joined defenses on the surface and carrying off the young man and young woman inside us. Yeah. And the way we feel that is we lose our joy. We lose our sense of humor. We, we lose our ability to, to kick our heels together and dance. Yeah. We've all seen the difference between uh, a young calf, you know, in a field, or at least I have, you know, having spent a lot of time out in rural England, <laughs> or a lamb, and then seeing the stolid cow <laughs> that it becomes, or the stolid sheep, <laughs> just chewing, looking vaguely off into the distance. That happens to so many of us as human beings. Yeah. The fire that you had yeah, has been extinguished. But actually, you are the one who has extinguished it as much as any dynamic you've run, to, run into it in the world. Yeah. And part of it has to do with the closing off of our vulnerabilities. I do think that the ability to understand our vulnerabilities, to live in them physically and not close them off, is is intimately connected to our sense of robustness in the world. When you're just an armored personality trying to be right all the time and trying to smash everything that tells you that you you might be wrong, we close off this innocent, invitational, intimate uh, instrument, you know, which is able to bring so much joy, not in only into our own lives, but into those that we meet. Yeah. And poetry, poetry is meant to speak to this part of you and create a kind of divine discontent. And I have a piece where, you know, it's, it's kind of addressing and inviting this part of ourselves. It's uh, called start close in, start close in. Don't take the second step or the first. 
start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until it becomes an intimate, private ear that can then really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing. Close in the step you don't want to take. And going back to the Beowulf, that's what Beowulf did. Like he, you know, something about that before that entrance, before he gets to the lake, he he's given armor, a helmet from you know the king. So here's this is going to help you. Yes. And he has to get rid of it because it's it's no use down there when he goes to kill Grindel. And yes. any weapon he yeah. had it was given, no use. In fact, he had to find a weapon down there that yes. ended up slaying the monster. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, so it's this radical simplification and this going down to a place where you feel you can't breathe. And it's interesting how the people of Denmark, you know, we missed a part of the story where Beowulf actually confronts Grendel when he comes out of the lake, defeats him, you know, and Grendel stumbles back into the lake, leaving a a bloody wounded trail behind him, you know, and then they hear his death cries there. So they think they're all free. And there's this great party starts up and they celebrate Beowulf and his great, uh, his great feat and all his previous feats, you know, and the party goes on, goes on all night. And then Beowulf and his men go to another room. They sleep all the rest of the night. They sleep through the day and they come back and they find the hall has been devastated again. Something else has come out from the swamp, fought off the guards, broken down the door, carried off another young man and woman, Grendel's mother. It's not the thing you fear, it's the mother of the thing you fear. So when when Beowulf decides to go down to the lake, he's going down to wrestle with the, the very root of the problem, not just the way that it displays itself on the surface, but the very the very actual jointure you know, and foundation of where this dynamic has come from. And there's an interesting dynamic because the people of Denmark don't want him to go down into the lake. They say, you've done your work. It's been great. You've been here, take your horses, take your gold, take your land. You know, we don't need you to go down there very, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, this is a very common dynamic for consultants when you go into a company and you're asked to come in to deal with a presenting dynamic and you you work with that and it goes away because almost everything does when you go away with it. There's lots of, of research that shows if you just turn, change the lighting in a room, then a lot of difficult things will go away temporarily. Yeah. As soon as you start to get towards the original dynamic that's been causing trouble in the company, everyone gets really nervous. And almost always the management will say, that's great. <laughs> You've done your work. I liked those little changes. We don't need to actually address this. You know, It's too scary. It's in a psychological area where quite often managers do not know how they don't know how to navigate it. Yeah. They have not had the psychological apprenticeship to the vulnerabilities and difficulties of, of the human beings trying to work together to do something difficult. Yeah. So I work, I, I mean, uh, when I'm in the workplace, I work a lot with what I call the phenomenology of conversation which is just a fancy philosophical way of saying what happens along the way when you try to have one, when you try to deepen it. Well, these things happen, these five things, these seven things happen. And when you run into it, and particularly when you, you, you run into any of these frightening milestones or phenomena, 
there's nothing wrong with it. And so I, and I have hundreds of poems memorized. So I, I bring poetry in that illustrates in a very real, very physical way in the room, what this looks like and why you're scared of having the conversation. And it's incredibly liberating for people. And I, it's actually incredibly liberating for men because women have more of an innate understanding of how conversations work. It's just that the inherited hierarchy quite often doesn't allow them to display that knowledge. But men in the classic sense have this inherited sense that, yes, women are better at conversations, but I don't know what they do when they're when they're doing them much better than I am. <laughs> you know, so men think having a real conversation is all vague and woolly. So it can be incredibly invitational to men when they discover, no, actually, you can un understand a whole process by which you deepen a conversation. And here are the illustrations. So Beowulf is a very magnified representation of what it's like when you get down there into the difficult place. You know, there's, I mean, uh, there's an incredible translation from the 1960s from a man called Burton Raffle that descri describes the hard place where you have to go to have that conversation. And it's in the image of this pool where Grendel and his mother have lived for centuries. Yeah. They call the huge one Grendel. If he had a father, no one knew him. Or if there were others before them, hidden evil before hidden evil, hidden evil before hidden evil, they live in secret places, wolf dens, where water pours from rocks then runs underground, where mist steams like black clouds, and the groves of trees hanging out over their lake are all covered with frozen spray and wind down snake-like roots that reach as far as the water and help keep it dark. At night, that lake burns like a torch. No one knows its bottom. No wisdom reaches such depths. A deer hunted through the woods by packs of hounds, a stag with great horns, though driven through the forest from faraway places, refuses to save its life in that water, prefers to die on that shore. It is not far from here, nor is it a pleasant spot. It is not far from here, nor is it a pleasant spot. I always say you can you see the English were into understatement even 1,200 years ago when this was <laughs> being recited. But there's the image of that stag dying on the shore, refusing to save its life in that water. That's the image of masculinity which refuses vulnerability. There's nothing more masculine than the image of the stag with the great tines, you know, against the sky. Yeah. This story is saying, you know, whatever powers you have in the outer physical world, their writ will not run below the surface of this lake. And the deer will, you will die on the shore pursued by hounds, yeah. But Beowulf has something else, yeah. Beowulf goes beneath the water and wrestles. There's this other image which I found incredibly puzzling to begin with and then incredibly useful. And that's this image of the trees around the lake feeding darkness into the water. And I remember it was a beautiful image when I was first reciting this poem. I remember I was working at AT&T, actually, out in New Jersey. And I remember they had a lake there with a fountain in the middle. And after I'd worked with this poem in the morning with these executives, because they had a, a difficult conversation to have. So this was a way of teeing up that conversation. I took myself around that little lake with a fountain and I said, what is this image with the, the roots feeding darkness down into the lake? I said, what's above the lake? We're above the lake, yeah. Quite often when we don't want to have a conversation, we will actually feed darkness down into that theme to give us the excuse not to go down. And we do it by saying, if I have this conversation, this will fall apart. Yeah. If I have this conversation, I won't be able to make a living anymore. If I have this conversation, 
these people won't respect me. Yeah. If I have this conversation, I won't have the same answers that I have now. I won't know where to go with it. Yeah. So we actually feed a kind of obscurity down there to give us the excuse not to go below the surface. Somehow, Beowulf has this mature form of masculinity, which is actually the masculine joined with the feminine, of being able to make a friend of the unknown and make a friend of the darkness and go down there to wrestle with Grendel's mother. So another thing that's hard for men with work, so right there, there's a, that fear of those, those hard conversations is a fear. So you have to just take that, that first step, go it towards it. But then another thing you write about too with work, particularly for men, is that a lot of men, they type their identity in their work. Yeah. Because that's, that's what you're just kind of told from a uh, boy, that you are what you do. You know, the, whenever you meet some guy for the first time, it's like, well, what do you do for a living? But there's a lot of men who can reach midlife or even they're 10 years into their career and they realize either I haven't accomplished that much as I hope I wanted to, or it's been a complete failure, or I'm even in the wrong career and they're figuring this out in their 40s, 50s. What insights have you, do you think poetry or, can provide men who have that sort of heartbreak or sort of that realization that their aspirations they had didn't, didn't work out they thought, the way they thought, or they actually, they doing the wrong thing? Um, yeah, very good question. I think, first of all, we have to contextualize this image of the classic male and work and, and labeling themselves because it's actually very magnified in, in North America, you know, way beyond many other cultures. If you're in Ireland, it can be sometimes impossible to find out what a what a person actually does. They won't mention it, actually. And it's seen as being very, you know, closing a conversation down to do it or to name things too much. So um, there are lots of conversations around work that are not held in the way they're held in North America. But what you're describing is is very North American male. And I think it just had to do with the way that the, the psyche was formed over the last few hundred years and uh, the struggle that was involved, you know. And I think the armor that had to be put on psychologically in all of the dark things that were done to make a new society in North America. So all of this has created a kind of isolated masculine identity in North America that I do believe is breaking apart now and that we're, and I do think, you know, this elevation of this malign form of masculinity into the White House is, is, is like a last ghost dance of that masculinity. We're seeing, we're seeing our flaws crystallized, you know. We're seeing what is what we don't want, you know, written across the heavens so that we can recognize it. And so the ability to have friendships outside of the workplace is really, really important. It's representative representative of a much larger musical chordal ability of the masculine soul, you know. One of the things I noticed coming to North America from Ireland and England was that was that American men mediated their emotional life. I'm talking about heterosexual men now, but uh, American het- heterosexual men um, mediated their emotional life through their wives or their girlfriends, actually. And though they had close friendships when they were growing up at school with other men and close friendships in college... It seemed to be something that was that was discarded once you went into the workplace. This is not the same dynamic that you find in Europe. You know, there is a much more powerful thread of adult male friendship in Irish and British society, and probably in a lot of other European societies and other societies around the world. I'm just speaking about the ones I'm really familiar with. Yeah. So there, out of that comes a kind of isolation for the American male, the Canadian male too, I'd say too, a necessity to keep reinforcing this perimeter that they've made around them. One of 
the invitations in a really good friendship is to a kind of sense of mutual humiliation. Yeah. When you have a close friendship over years, you will always humiliate yourself before your friend. Yeah. And you will always have to pick yourself up and reconstitute the relationship and they will do the same thing. The other thing is in a long friendship, you will always insult your friend. You will actually say something to them that they didn't want to hear. Yeah. Almost always accidentally on purpose, something that you've wanted to tell them that you haven't been able to tell them. And then they get insulted and they walk off. But because the friendship has lasted for years, by definition, they came back actually, and they forgave you. And you would have had to have done the same thing to them. A really close male friendship keeps you connected to your sense of forgiveness, of mercy, and of vulnerability in the world. When we lose that sense of comradeship, yeah, and we all know the way, you know, one of the great things about, I mean, men come under a lot of pressure and a lot of criticism right now, and it's just our time to take it, you know, in history, because the shoe's on the other foot now, so we just have to take it. But one of the great things about masculine company and companionship is this beautiful, when it's done right, you know, not in a sense of hazing, but this beautiful sense of mutual humiliation of having to have a sense of humor about yourself. Yeah. But the people who are humiliating you, if they're good friends, have your best interests at heart at the same time. They, they're doing it because you're getting far from yourself. You're pretending to be someone you're not. You're getting above yourself. You know? And they're trying to bring you back to a more grounded relationship. They're also trying to bring you back to what your gift might be that they haven't yet received yet, but that they intuit is there. Yeah. So one of the great things about male friendship is robustness. You know, the, the ability to take knocks, to be humiliated in one another's company and to forgive one another at the same time through the natural difficulties and distances of friendship over time. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, one of the ways you can build robustness into the inevitable setbacks, failures, heartbreaks you experience at work is to to foster or nurture those friendships outside of work. Yes, exactly. And and that's representative also of a greater friendship with the natural world too, you know. One of the great tragedies and diagnostics of a narrowed work life is when you when you stop sailing, you know, when you stop going out and climbing or, or being in the mountains, when you stop enjoying the sky or the trees, you know, when you stop adventuring because you don't have time for it or you can't find that person inside you. you know, so friendship with another person, if we've lost those friendships, it's almost always, I feel, representative of having lost a greater friendship with natural creation at the same time. Because you're, it's you're going back to this idea of like it's you're you're look, you're exploring the conversational nature of reality, and it's hard to have a conversation with just yourself. Yes, yeah, and uh, as we're coming towards the end of our of our conversation here, and a real conversation always ends up with your physical and psychological breakdown. I always say no one survives a real conversation. <laughs> in the manner to which, and it's why men won't have them in a in a relationship or marriage when they're young, because their identity is so connected to the perimeter they've set up, uh, saying this is me and this is not me. Yeah. Partly for evolutionary reasons, you know, but the journey of a male into maturity is is learning how to be broken down. Yeah how to have a good sense of humor about it, how to know that there's always someone waiting for you on the other side of that atomization, on the other side of that pulling apart. There's someone calling to you and inviting you into a deeper understanding of what it means to be fully male, yeah. which of course has to do with understanding 
the deeply feminine parts of yourself that you've kept at bay. That's what Beowulf had to do. I'd say so, yeah. yeah. Well, as we end this conversation, is there a, a poem or a prose that we could end with that you think kind of kind of touches on the themes we've been hitting, talking about today? Yes, there's a poem called The Bell and the Blackbird. And this really has to do with the unification of the inner and the outer worlds, you know, uh, the bringing together of the masculine and the feminine in many ways. And The Bell and the Blackbird is actually a... Um, a kind of meme in the Irish tradition. It comes from the story of a monk standing at the edge of the monastic precinct back in, you know, there's a a really remarkable form of Christianity extant in Ireland between the 5th and the 10th centuries. It was called the Irish Church or Celtic Christianity, and they had a really incredible relationship with both their inner world and the natural world outside. They didn't see the natural world as being competition to believing in in their religion. You know? So here's this monk, he's standing on the edge of the monastic precinct. He hears the bell calling him to prayer. And he says to himself, that's the most beautiful sound in the world, which is the, the call to the inner world, you know, to becoming more generous, a bigger person also, you know, a larger foundation. But at exactly the same time, because nothing's straightforward in the Irish tradition, he hears the blackbird calling from outside of the monastic wall. And he says to himself, and that is also the most beautiful sound in the world, which is the world calling to you just as it finds you. The physical world as it is, with no changes, nothing. You've just got to meet it as you find it. So this is the piece I wrote dedicated to that ancient Irish meme, The Bell and the Blackbird. It's also the title poem of a collection I have of that name, The Bell and the Blackbird. The bell and the blackbird, the sound of a bell still reverberating, the sound of a bell still reverberating, or a blackbird, a blackbird calling from a corner of the field, asking you to wake into this life or inviting you deeper into the one that waits. The sound of a bell still reverberating, or a blackbird, a blackbird calling from a corner of the field, asking you to wake into this life, or inviting you deeper into the one that waits. Either way takes courage. Either way wants you to become nothing but that self that is no self at all. Wants you to walk to the place where you find you already know you'll have to give every last thing away. The approach that is also the meeting itself, the approach that is also the meeting itself without any meeting at all, that radiance you have always carried with you, that radiance you have always carried with you as you walk both alone and completely accompanied in friendship by every corner of the world crying alleluia well david white this has been a great conversation thank you so much for your time lovely thank you brett wish you well my guest today was david white he's a poet and philosopher and the author of multiple books they're all available on amazon.com you can find out more information about his work at his website davidwhite.com that's w-h-y-t-e.com also check out our show notes at aom.is slash white where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic 